Hello and welcome to Security Scan. I am Vishal Dahiya and in this week we will take a look at the milestones of the year 2018 when it comes to the three armed forces. From new acquisitions to policies to joint exercises, the year 2018 has been full of activities for Indian armed forces. Significant deals were signed, such as the one for state-of-the-art mobile surface-to-air missile system S-400 Triumph and Grigorovich class stealth frigates and multi-role utility helicopters for Indian Navy. Armed forces also got several new equipments, including M777 Hovitzers and K-9 Vajra artillery guns. India also achieved the distinction of having a fully functional nuclear triad in 2018 with first indigenous nuclear ballistic missile submarine INS Arihant completing its first deterrence patrol. Several tests were also conducted for indigenous missiles such as uh, beyond visual air range air-to-air -air missile Astra, Agni-5 and anti-tank guided missiles as well. Top commanders of the Indian Army also approved a mega plan to bring in transformative reforms in the 1.3 million strong force. All three forces also participated in several exercises throughout the year, displaying their prowess. For a closer look at the milestones of 2018, with respect to armed forces, we have with us a distinguished panel of three guests in the studio today. Let me start by introducing these gentlemen to you, beginning with the retired Major General Ravi Arora, Chief Editor of Indian Military Review. We also have with us retired Air Commodore Prashant Dixit and retired Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha. Welcome, all of you gentlemen, to Rajya Sabha TV studios. Let me begin with you, General Arora, and let's begin with the Army only, because there's been a lot of talk about you know, bringing in reforms as well as uh, new equipments which the army has got and several new deals which are, uh, you know, under consideration as well. What would you uh, pick up as the highest point or the most important one as far as Indian Army is concerned? For the first time since 1980, we have new artillery guns being inducted into the army. I think this is a very significant event. Not only the... K-9 self-propelled Vajra uh, gun, which you mentioned, but also the Dhanush uh, Howitzer developed by the Ordnance Factory Board based on the transfer of technology and the designs of the Bofors gun, which came in in 1980s. Uh, the Dhanush gun has been developed. It has been tested over two years and it is now ready for induction. Mm -hmm. Besides this, we also have the indigenous ATAGS, Advanced Stored Artillery Gun System, developed by Bharat Forge and Tatas, which has also set a world record in range and is uh, now ready for user trials. This is also likely to be inducted shortly. Uh, we also have the M777 Ultra Light Howitzer, mm -hmm. which we have imported. It has also undergone user trials. Range tables are ready and will be inducted any time. So all at once during this year, these four different types of guns being ready for the army is wonderful news for the army, which has, which has been waiting for more than 30 years, 38 years for new guns to be inducted. It is a requirement of 3,800 guns out of which 1,800 alone are towed guns. Mm -hmm. And we saw in the Kargil conflict that this is a game changer which we had been waiting for. The Bofors gun is now very old and it was high time that these guns were brought in. Okay, so artillery guns is uh, very significant as far as Indian Army is concerned. We'll come to the uh, uh, reformative process uh, part as well, but let's first go to the other two forces. Uh, uh, Ekomar Dikshit, from the Indian Air Force's point of view as well, there have been uh, several uh, things which have happened throughout the year. Which one would you pick uh, as uh, the most important as far as uh, the Indian Air Force's uh, capability improvement is concerned? Well, honestly speaking, Vishal, in the throes of the shortages with the combat forces of the Air Force has been living with, I think steps have been taken very positively again to augment this. Let me illustrate. The Air Force brought out a, the request for proposals for 114 aircraft, the, ten, the tender for which was to have opened on 4th of July. Max, the, the, in the middle of the year, nothing has happened to her so far. Then they have got on to the AMCA project, which is being done by the ARD mm -hmm. for the new stealth fighter aircraft, which, which had to be brought in because we had called off 
the uh, the development of fifth generation combat aircraft being developed with the russian connection mm -hmm. these are the two things which have happened mind you the 114 aircraft had to be done because the number of rafales were reduced for the government policy and therefore they had to do but i think the biggest thing which the indian air force did this particular year is to test itself out whether they the had gagan the, shakti yeah gagan shakti in which they flew i think 11000 sorties over a period of 5 years and i have often said in your own channels in the past that they wanted to do long strike distance strike to illustrate that took off from a, a a base in far east of india to cut across the indian peninsular uh, area to hit uh, north of the maldives the lakshadweep islands and down south they again took off and hit a target near the channel 4 which admiral will describe better mm -hmm. in the entrance uh, to the 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 sea lanes over there these are the basically two things although if you recall apache aircraft have been ordered sukhorsky has been have but they bring out a very very uh, positive change in the capacity of lifting uh, platforms for the uh, air force and uh, i believe that there are several beneficiaries of that including border roads and things like that especially that um, sikorsky helicopter twin rotors that is being inducted mm -hmm. but if i had to sum it up very quickly i would say that the effort has been to look at is the air force's own uh, shortages and to work towards it, towards them in a more positive manner to be prepared for the tomorrows okay that's a serious thing uh, to be considered these days okay we'll come back uh, to uh, the future question as well uh, let's bring in uh, vice admiral uh, shekhar sinha here uh, well if you look at from indian navy's perspective it has been a very hectic uh, uh, year for them uh, quite a lot of uh, activity in terms of uh, you know all phases be it uh, india finally having uh, the operational nuclear triad uh, with the ins arihant completing its uh, veterans patrol then you have uh, stealth frigate uh, agreement also being signed with russia and and uh, many other as well which one would you believe uh, and pick up rather as uh, indian navy's uh, highest or topmost achievement this year i think vishal the topmost achievement is the commissioning of arihant and arihant completing the first veterans uh, patrol uh, mind you it is uh, built by drdo and navy jointly uh, and a lot of it has also been built by the private sector so navy is uh, you know the getting the private sector into indigenous uh, components into our submarine arm is one very big achievement and keeping ourselves again on the subsurface uh, path is the commissioning of the uh, the diesel submarine uh, the first one uh, which has got commissioned the scorpion class submarines and the second one is to follow um, on the surface front we have had the induction of the kolkata class destroyers for the first time we shall we have long range sams of the barak variety which is jointly developed by drdo and the israeli company uh, it has a, it has a range of uh, 80 kilometers and 80 kilometers gives you a very very formidable air defense measure mm -hmm. uh, you know within the envelope where the uh, fleet is likely to be moving either in a force projection or in attack and as far as the airborne assets are concerned the signing of the s uh, 90 r helicopters uh, which was a long felt requirement of an sw helicopter uh, that has been signed to my mind in three fields that is surface subsurface uh, and and surface uh, and air uh, elements mm -hmm. these are the three big achievements which i would i would like to point out okay uh, let's uh, come back to uh, the army uh, general arora and uh, something which uh, we spoke about in the uh, first few minutes as well the entire uh, process of uh, reforms as far as the indian army is concerned was something uh, which was uh, talked about a lot in the uh, throughout the year and top commanders uh, had also given their go ahead so how would you look at this entire uh, reform process and how it might benefit as far as indian army is concerned you know this transformation studies ordered by the army started sometime at the beginning of this year and they have been deliberated by the army commanders twice during the year and these studies the recommendations are now being evaluated before they are sent to the government i believe in the beginning of uh, next year they are to do with rationalization reorganization to improve operational efficiency keeping with the latest doctrines 
So it has been talked about that instead of divisions in some sectors, we'll have integrated battle groups of all arms, uh, smaller, tighter, uh, with better command and control, with all the wherewithal, with all that they require to carry out operations. Then there is a rationalization of the organization of army headquarters uh, and uh, you know, looking at the terms of engagement of the JCOs and other ranks, mm -hmm. including their uh, cadre review, uh, the idea is to save money and to save manpower, not to cut down things uh, or to give it back to the government, but to get more money for capital schemes, for acquiring new weapon platforms and strength for raising uh, additional units for specialized warfare purposes. So this is a work in progress. It's not a milestone of this year per se, because uh, uh, when it comes about and the way it comes about and the measures in which it is implemented will show whether it's a, a big event. Uh, because in the past, we have seen almost 13 studies carried out. Mm -hmm. and the results have not been encouraging. Whatever is within the power of the army to implement, they have done so. But when it comes to uh, getting the orders of the government to implement some of those important aspects, uh, we fall short. They are, okay. not, they are not forthcoming. So let's see how this plays out. Okay, this is something, uh, one uh, aspect which we need to go ahead and uh, you know keep an eye on. Ekamra uh, Dikshit, one more aspect when it comes to Indian force, uh, which uh, was uh, you know uh, being talked about of the year, was the work in progress on the indigenous fighter Tejas. Uh, be it about Mark II or be it about uh, ISA radars being procured for uh, uh, the LCA. So how do you see Tejas uh, filling in those gaps which you were mentioning in your earlier answer about uh, the overall uh, numbers as far as uh, the uh, fighting squad and strength of the Indian Air Force is concerned? Vishal, the HAL boss in a statement made yesterday said that during this year they will give only nine Tejas aircraft. The rest will come down the line. And when he's talking about the 1A version out of 83 are being ordered, that is still not being uh, considered for to pay place an order on HL. Mm -hmm. So all I can say that development of that field is uncertain. But I want to make another comment, if I may. You know, when you talked about the Agni 5, and you talked about the use, utilization of space, for special uh, ch uh, channels for Air Force and the Navy in your last program, mm -hmm. let me quickly tell you... The GZ-7A, which was yes, launched. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I think those are greater achievements for larger space applications. What is happening is that along with the Navy, there's a communication transponders, are, 40 of them are being placed for the Air Force. And down the line, they'll come for the Army. The greater advantages will come in the strategic posture of not merely the uh, Air Force, but all the three services. And I think uh, this will add to the larger game plan of creating your own space command, your own cyber command, and your own special operations command, which are being considered all over. Mm -hmm. About the Agni-5, let me add to your statement to say that those were user trials. The Agni-5 and the so series are already under development. Maybe for the induction into Strategic Forces Command, which is manned by the, all the three services, that is what is happening. And let the rest of the world take note that we have arrived at that. And uh, we are thus able to neutralize targets as far as 5,000 kilometers away. So on the strategic field, when all the three forces join up, I think there is a great activity visible. And that is, fills my heart to share that notion with you. Okay. Uh, Admiral Sina, on, on the Indian Navy's part, it is always being said that when, uh, you know, uh, talk about all uh, three forces and when you look at uh, uh, from the perspective of Make in India or the indigenization, Indian Navy is the one which is, uh, you know, uh, has uh, made a stride ahead of uh, both the Air Force uh, and Army. So in, in that perspective, how would you uh, describe Indian Navy's uh, achievements as far as this year is concerned, uh, going ahead and uh, making things indigenously? As I mentioned, Vishal, the Kolkata class ships are uh, fully indigenous. Uh, the, uh, the missile, as I mentioned, it's a joint development between DRDO and the Israeli aircraft industry. Uh, so that is one very big achievement that we have made. And if you go and see these destroyers, uh, I had the uh, opportunity to visit one of them very recently. 
uh, they are actually world class uh, world class uh, ships they can do 33 34 knots they can keep an enemy away an airborne enemy away beyond 70 miles which is a big achievement um, everything is fully automatic mm -hmm. and it has got an uh, equivalent of an isar radar nothing is required to be done it does the scanning it selects the target it tracks the target and it destroys the target so i think on the indigenous front it is quite uh, quite a big achievement okay. having said that even the scorpion class submarine as you know is now being built here in uh, mdl in uh, mumbai uh, but on the policy front there is one big change which has taken place uh, you know with the arrival of china in the indian ocean region and their collusion with pakistan it was uh, it was being sensed that the maneuvering space for the navy and so for the whole country in the indian ocean is actually going to shrink because you will have these fellows all over the place or mm -hmm. maybe the places where you don't didn't expect so the decision has been taken that okay let us monitor the wider space and in that context the fusion center which came up in gurugram the other day the, the defense minister inaugurated that has got a very important significance 28 countries are part of it and by saying it is an IOR fusion center, meaning that anybody who thinks that free and open uh, navigation is, is the order of the day and the rule of the law must prevail, those countries can join this. So that is one. The second thing which big important thing that has happened is the Navy has decided that it will have mission-based deployment. All the choke points, mm -hmm. the Straits of Hormuz, the Gulf of Aden, the Straits of Malacca, the Lombok Strait, the Sunda Strait, at all those straits, we have either a submarine or an aircraft or a surface ship on patrol 24-7. So that's a very big achievement. Now okay. you will say, okay, fine, they have to come back to harbor to, uh, you know, to take fuel and go back. In that context, the signing of Lemoir, both with the U.S. and a similar one with France, gives us the access to operate from Reunion Island. With Indonesia, we have signed an agreement for Sabang on the... On the uh, uh, on the Gulf Coast, we have signed an agreement with Oman mm -hmm. uh, for Dukum port. And I'm sure that in coming days, there will be some signatures in, in the African coast. So that gives you a very wide area to monitor and expand your strategic space of maneuvering for all services, those who can reach. Okay. Otherwise, with, with China coming in and Pakistan closing up too much... It, we're getting a feeling that, you know, we are going to shrink in our space. But okay. that has been done away with. Okay. Uh, coming back to uh, the uh, joint exercise and the other exercises part, uh, you know, uh, Air Commodore Dixit pointed out uh, Gagan Shakti. And uh, I'd like to bring in uh, General Aroda here. General Aroda, uh, you know, uh, like all three forces, Indian Army also participated in a number of exercises, joint exercises with a number of countries. Uh, one is, uh, which is definitely our viewers would want to uh, know about it, is that what purpose does these exercises serve? And since this year had seen so many of them, how would it have benefited uh, the forces? See, uh, we have been exercising, uh, we have been doing joint exercises between the, amongst the services, mm -hmm. and we have been doing joint exercises with friendly foreign nations, including China. Uh, we go to China and the Chinese come here to do these exercises. The purpose of doing exercises with foreign powers uh, is, to, uh, is to inculcate friendliness, it is military diplomacy. It is also one of the purposes is to let them see what they are using. It is a Philip being given to defense exports. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the defense exports promotion scheme includes doing joint exercises. Uh, and of course, it sends out signals uh, about our friendship with the, these countries. Mm -hmm. Within the uh, armed forces, we do joint exercises, particularly because we don't have joint organization or joint command. That is to have better synergy amongst the three services. Amongst the three services. Uh, and when it comes to doing joint operations, we know each other's SOPs and we follow a common SOP. Okay. That is the purpose. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, you know, we're running short of time, but let's look at what uh, the future holds uh, for... Uh, all three forces and what might be the challenges when we talk about 2019. Let's begin with the Indian Air Force, uh, Ekamara Dixit. From uh, the IAF's perspective, what do you believe for the next one year at least should be the topmost on the agenda as far as uh, the Air Force is concerned? And what is it that is uh, uh, clearly very, very important for the force? Well, having put their induction programs into the pipeline, I think the Air Force uh, should now build to... Uh, to practice the aspect of jointness, which is very necessary, and that is the fulcrum 
of the thinking of the Indian Armed Forces. Some efforts have been done. I might as well add, they did an uh, exercise in rapid air mobility mm -hmm. where they lifted 500 tons of uh, load. Uh, this is done by Western uh, Command over a six hours period. Now, this is an exercise in togetherness with the Indian Army. The Air Force by itself has no meaning. So, there is a participation. The synergy between both yes. forces. Also, I might as well add, we are talking about global exercises. Under the aegis of the Shanghai Cooperation, we did an exercise managed by the Russians in which we went along with the Pakistani troops to practice counter-terrorist practices. Mm -hmm. I think in your program several years ago, months uh, programs ago, you have talked about this. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is a great uh, foreign policy posture. Having said that, let me put it this way, that the, whilst the Air Force has tried to uh, demonstrate to the Indian milieu and the Indian uh, uh, largely uh, populace that they have built in a capacity for outreach, for uh, joint togetherness and going to uh, 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 the American uh, mm -hmm. mainland for, uh, for exercises, conducting paratrooping over there where mm -hmm. the troops went from the special forces element of the Indian Army. Mm -hmm. So there is this uh, uh, practice of understanding the overall role of the Indian Armed Forces and to be an active participant in that process. That is what I see would be uh, probably be looked at in the years to come. Okay. Uh, Admiral Sina, from uh, the Indian uh, Navy's perspective, uh, now that uh, we have uh, INS Arihant operational and several other uh, ships and frigates uh, being uh, made, uh, what exactly would you see the topmost on the agenda of Indian Navy for 2019? I'll take off from where uh, Air Commodore Dikshit finished. Uh, you know, we already have in process the major amphibious exercises when it comes to amongst the services. All three services participate. And what do we practice? We practice in the peacetime to how to manage a disaster, how to mitigate the impacts of disaster, and we go on to our own territories and we go worldwide. Particularly in the Indian Ocean region is going to be very, very relevant. So these exercises have to be sort of more frequent and participation of larger number of forces. In wartime, it's a good thing that you can land your troops in out-of-area contingency, or we have island territories. If there are any doubts about, you know, its safety and security, our forces can be landed very, very, very quickly with all three forces combined. So we have a SOP already and that needs to be rehearsed. When it comes to with the international uh, sort of exercises, where the Navy is a very large participant of so many countries, uh, multi, uh, multilateral exercises, uh, Malabar is one example. The interoperability amongst the nations is a very important thing. But tomorrow, if two, three countries have to come together, even to operate in peacetime, and if they don't have the standard operating procedure as to what will be the interoperability processes, those SOPs are being laid down. And this is the biggest achievement of the, of the Indian Navy, mm -hmm. along with other countries, that you can operate together without having to bother how will I talk to him, how will I operate, what will be the SOP. So these things have been sorted out. And with many more countries, it needs to be done. Okay. Japan has to come on board because Japan has got a little pacifist uh, or pessimist uh, sort of uh, defense posture. Mm -hmm. But now they are coming out of it and they will have the aircraft carrier, and we have had a lot of experience of operating the carriers. So I am going to see that, I will think that, you know, this needs to be hastened, and I'm sure it will get hastened. Okay. Uh, General, from uh, Indian Army's uh, point of view? Not only Indian Army, but for all three services, the capabilities that we desire to have by the year 2030, mm -hmm. and we all have the long-term perspective plan laid out, if we want to achieve that, we must start allocating more money for modernization, which we are not doing at the present, with the result that it is desirable that we should have 30 to 40 percent of state-of-the-art futuristic technologies, equipment and platforms, uh, about 30 percent of contemporary technologies, and maybe do with 30 percent of, uh, you know, legacy equipment or obsolete uh, technologies. This has to be reversed. Right now, the situation is not good. We must allocate more we, as far as the army is concerned, some steps have been taken, like uh, this year we found uh, the INSAS rifle is being replaced, mm -hmm. the bulletproof jackets are being provided, the artillery guns are coming in. Uh, but as far as the 
armor goes as far as uh, infantry fighting vehicles go we haven't almost we haven't started the process whatever we started had hiccups and we took two steps back as far as air defense guns go a large number of them require replacement so we are running behind uh, behind our adversaries who are going forward in leaps and bounds to modernize their forces we must keep that in mind Okay, wonderful. So as our panelists have pointed out, these are the major milestones for uh, all the three armed forces as far as 2018 is concerned and what to watch out for in the next year. We'll leave it at that here. But uh, a lot of New Year wishes for all our soldiers, veterans and all our viewers from me and my team at Rajasabha TV. Keep watching RSTV.